Techbusters proudly brought to you by Ericsson. Good evening and welcome to Tech Busters, your get everything you need to know TV show with me and the famous Aki Anastasio. You're the famous one, not me. Everything you need to know about technology in a world that's moving so quickly that even Toby and I are struggling to keep up. We're holding on to those handlebars and the world of technology is moving so quickly it's a rattling. Are you well, Mr. Shapsha? I'm just a rattling along with you. <laughs> but first, let's take a look at what's coming up. Tonight on Techbusters, Aki chats to Ericsson's Henrik Lennart about mobility and broadband penetration, and the team head up to Rwanda to interview Peter Heumann about the Rwanda interoperability switch and what it means. Get networked tonight on Techbusters. Well, this I found fascinating uh, a, a few days ago. Apple and Samsung supply a Foxconn. Now, if you don't know who Foxconn is, Foxconn is the, one of the biggest companies, and it's the biggest factory in the world that makes your iPhone, it makes your Xbox, your PS4. These guys make a lot of the technology. So they've got different lines producing different things. And it was astonishing to discover that they replaced 60,000 factory workers. That's at 60 thousand factory workers with robots. China is investing heavily in robot workforces and I've been looking at this uh, with a great deal of interest because China is one of those uh, countries that produces obviously as we know the most of the goods that we have in the world but 60,000 jobs is quite a number. Hey? It's also significant that a company of Foxconn's size and importance mm. is in effect leading the charge because there's a lot of the automated process of, of, uh, of putting a, a device like a phone or an iPad or a computer together yes. that, that, that makes it very possible to automate it with a robot and the accuracy of the robots, the, you know, they have little readers and infrared yeah. readers they can check they're putting it on the right place in the circuit board. There's obviously a very good business case for doing that and I'm sure it's much cheaper for Foxconn to use robots but it's 60,000 people without a job now. And you know it's not only Foxconn, I mean we know that this kind of process has been automated in the automobile industry but even like McDonald's got into a bit of hot water recently um, if you have been reading the news that you know they were talking about the increases in the staff that work in these fast food restaurants and they were saying listen we can replace people with robots and they can do that now. There's burger machines, there's all sorts of devices that make food and this is the world that we're living in realistically. All those it's manual true. jobs you know, are going to the, be replaced by, human, by, by robots. A lot of the, of the automotive industries are being replaced by robots. You know, Tesla has these huge, yeah. massive robots doing things. BMW, part of the success of the R8, I'm told, is that they use a, a very automated system to put it together. I mean, there have been some cases where companies have gone back to humans because they've needed a finer sense of detail mm. and they've also needed a bit of judgment you know you kind of need to yeah. apply a bit of judgment but I mean I've I've been I've been saying I could replace a, uh, with someone with a robot for ages well you know I I've, as you were saying that I was just thinking wouldn't it be wonderful if a robot replaced you it would have a, a better personality than you and uh, probably be funnier than you as well and way more interesting than you so but I guess I'll just have to wait for the robot. You know what the problem is? They can replace everything else about him, but the hair can't do anything about the hair. <laughs> when you look at the continent of Africa and you look at the population of 1.1 billion people that we have, and you look at how many smartphones are on the continent, right now it's about 200 million smartphones. But this number is set to literally explode as the cost of devices comes down and you know the continent wants to move to more connected devices and do more things and social media etc the move from feature phones to smartphones is afoot in a very quick way i chatted to hendrik lennert from ericsson earlier about where they see this technology moving and how they see the smartphone penetration growing on the continent and what people are going to be able to do with the smartphones we're at ericsson hq in woodmeet johannesburg and we're here to talk to hendrik lennert 
about mobility and he is responsible for sub-saharan africa and the broadband penetration and really getting people connected on the continent and ericsson of course doing amazing work i mean they one of the pioneers of this particular industry in connecting people throughout the continent and we've seen this evolution of mobility we know that it's all about mobile in africa and going from 2g to 3g to 4g to lte lteu and in fact just recently they announced a project together with the mtn with the lte utex technology but where is it going is 5g the next generation network how will we connect the next generation of people on the continent it has taken us quite some some time and if you look at the sub saharan africa for example it has taken slightly longer if you say africa versus if you say the more uh, mature markets like north america and asia yes uh, but i think with the introduction of 4g we're definitely picking up you could say the pace in africa and uh, also on the way to 5G. So this recent announcement that you made, the LTEU technology together with MTN, explain it to us, how does that work? To be able to understand how it works, we have to look into how the radio spectrum, uh, the frequency spectrum is, is utilized today. Right. Uh, you have a certain part of the spectrum that today is called the licensed spectrum, yeah. which is in a way you can say motorways for the radio waves, okay. which are dedicated to certain mobile operators. That means that, that they have, you could say, their own motorway where they can decide if they want to use it for 2G, 3G or 4G. Okay, so they got their own roads, you know, licensed to the operators. Exactly. And then we have another part of the frequency spectrum that today is called the so-called unlicensed spectrum. Then that's still motorways, you can say, but it's for anybody to utilize. If you, of course, uh, follow a certain set of rules. And what we have done with M10 here is that we have showcased that we take a part of that dedicated motorway and combine it with, you can say, a part of the motorway that is for anyone to use. And then we, by combining that, we achieve a, a downlink throughput of, of above 200 megabits per second. Now, the, the Ericsson Mobility Report is really, really interesting. And you look at the penetration of phones. I mean, most of Africa have got phones. They might be feature phones, they're not smartphones. But the growth, the projected growth of smartphones, uh, where we're sitting at just, what, over 200 million units in the, on the continent. But you're talking about 600 million and above by the end of this decade, which is quite a fast increase. It's in four years, and it's literally going to triple the numbers. Do we have the capacity and the infrastructure to deal with such growth that's going to happen? No, definitely not. And I mean, you, you mentioned the, the mobile smartphone, the smartphone penetration that we expect will increase. But in addition to that, the amount of mobile broadband subscriptions will go from just above 180 million today to more than 800 million in a five year period. In addition to that, and that's you can say even more frightening, if you can put it like that, is that the amount of mobile broadband data is expected to increase 15 times during the same period. So there will be a lot of, uh, you can say, um, stress on the networks, and they need to be prepared to handle that. So what do the networks have to do? Do they have to change? Because at the moment, most networks are running 3G. There's quite a bit of LTE happening in many parts of Africa, but um, this requires a substantial investment into the network. And, uh, and if you don't do it, your networks are simply going to fall over. Yeah, exactly. It's, uh, we can expect a huge build out of the network, as well as you can say, an application of more advanced technologies in the networks. And that's again an example of what we have, have you can say, tested here with, with MTN in South Africa. That's one of the means to address, you can say, the expected growth of, of, of data. From Ericsson's side, we see LTE as, you can say, the natural step uh, towards 5G. Uh, and you have, you say, more advanced variants of LTE on that way towards 5G. The other big impact that it's going to have is on smart cities. So I know that there are projects like to offload some of the load in the city, give Wi-Fi access to people, for example, so that the mobile networks don't take as much strain. But certainly in many cities across Africa, we are seeing a tremendous amount of uh, investment being made into making the cities smarter, right? Yeah, exactly. Now, there's a lot of things happening across the continent when it comes to, you could say, the penetration of mobile broadband and mobile broadband access. Uh, a lot of investments, and again, we have recently launched LTE with MTN in Ghana, and we have early on launched LTE in Nigeria with Smile and Natcom, for example. So a lot of things is happening, and to come back to what I mentioned earlier, we believe that, you can say, Africa as such is picking up the pace here and closing the gap to the more mature markets. What are you seeing uh, interesting patterns in actual users? The moment the speed of a device increases, 
the user's whole experience changes because now video becomes seamless and video is going to be the big focus going forward. Video will be a lot, uh, you can say there will be a lot of data generated from, from video in the network, that's the expectation. We actually expect that 60% of all traffic in the mobile broadband will be from video in five years from now. So yes, there's a lot of things happening and there's a lot of, of opportunities that is being made possible through faster access to, for example, the internet or to the cloud in general. And that's tied into 4G, but it's also tied into 5G. Uh, one of the things we demonstrated recently in our headquarters in Sweden is, uh, you could say, a driverless bus, uh, uh, you say, controlled through 5G technology. We believe it would be possible to have remote healthcare, including uh, remote surgery, as an example. And, and on that part, we are working together with, uh, we say, many other industries like mining, for example, mining companies, uh, uh, truck uh, uh, manufacturers as well, to see how we can apply these type of fast uh, uh, mobile broadband connections and, and utilize that to develop a whole lot of, you could say, new uh, opportunities. And I believe that, that Africa will, will benefit a lot from that. And I don't think we should sit and wait for, for the mature markets again to, to, to develop this. I think there's a lot of, of things we can apply here. Uh, so let's grab those opportunities together. How do the average speeds on mobile compare across different countries that you've experienced? It differs a lot and there's a lot of different reasons to that. But you can, you can put it like this, that you can say an ideal 3G connection you will be able to have like 20 megabits per second or with more advanced features in 3G you can reach uh, uh, close to 40 megabits per second. On an ID connection for, for LTE that will be 75 megabits per second. But of course we are far away from that in you can say the real environment and, and you can have very very big span there. This is some of the things we are driving together with, with our customers and we have a focus area on what we call best performing networks where we together with the operators understand how to configure their networks and how to make it possible to provide the best end user experience. Henrik, great chatting to you. Thank you for Thank your you. time. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I was recently on a cruise ship, the world's biggest cruise ship called the Harmony of the Seas, and the one thing that really caught my eye was this bar. But what was fascinating about this bar is there were no bartenders or bar ladies, whatever you want to call them. The drinks were all served by robots and it was called the Bionic Bar. And the company that's designed this one is called Maker Shaker. And they're using robots that traditionally you would find working in a factory that makes cars, for example, and arms, etc. And what they've done is they've modified these robots to be able to work together with the drinks that are situated above the robot, as you'll see in the, in the, in the, the video coming up. But the amazing thing about this is how they are adapting technology that is traditionally used in factories to work in modern day life and uh, take over jobs of barmen because literally this is what this robot does. You order your drinks using an iPad, you can design your own drink, you press the button and the robot simply makes the drinks and delivers them to you. Check this out. This is the Bionic Bar on board the Harmony of the Seas. Tell us about this technology behind us. It's uh, quite an amazing little robot. Uh, tell us about it. So Maker Shaker was born originally as a social experiment where we wanted to, to, to study the way in which new technologies interact with people's life and change, can change people's lives for every day. So we started studying this around the concept of a bar. Just, I mean, we are Italian, we're from Torino, so we have a, a good relationship with bars. So we started all as an experiment, like I said, and it was all back in 2013. So we, made, we built our first prototype, which we showcased in Milano and San Francisco. And after that, we started working with Royal Caribbean to create the Bionic Bar. Now, what Bionic Bar is, is not only a robotic bartending system, but it's a whole experience, which is now on board of, our, of, of four uh, Royal Caribbean ships. And the experience is based, uh, is based around the way in which the, the is based around the concept of people becoming their own bartender. So every customer can come on board, can come to a tablet where there is an application which allows them to either choose a drink from a recipe, a recipe list, or create their own. And in the create process is really what makes the experience special because everyone can customize the drink as he likes. So sometimes maybe you can end up mixing vodka and rum, which is not very the best choice ever. But again, you can really have the flexibility of creating and experimenting on new drinks. 
and after that the robots will make it for you. So you basically uh, put your, um, you put some kind of a card on there with a magnetic strip, right? So it transfers the order onto that. Yeah, on board of the ship, uh, Maker Shaker is a worldwide system. We, we also work uh, on land, but on board of the ship, we have this great integration with the ship's uh, uh, passenger system, which basically allows us from the SIPAS card, which is the room key card, we get all the information from the user. So the, val the user validates uh, their birth year just to make sure that it can access the application and is the right user. And after that, it's actually granted uh, access to the app. You can customize the drink and then the payment system, of course, also seamlessly within the app without the need of any additional tapping or, or credit card because everything is, is again. So now I look up here, you know, how many drinks can you accommodate here? Well, uh, I, we would say a goggle of drinks, so 10 to the power of 100. You can basically make every infinite, uh, infinite possible, almost infinite possible combination because we have 160 bottles in the ceiling, 16 mixers like juices and sodas. We have lemon and lime, slices of lemon and lime, and sugar, brown and white sugar. And, and how many drinks can the robots make per hour? So we are about uh, 120 drinks per hour between the two arms. It's amazing, and, and they just don't stop, they just carry on, they clean themselves. I see that there's a wash basin at the back, so in between the, the different cocktails it does its own drink, uh, own cleaning, right? That is correct. Every cocktail we do have a uh, washing and rinsing cycle, where basically we clean the shaker for every residue from the previous drink, just because we have to make sure that the taste is perfect every drink. And the robots, well, they are very precise in the dispensing because they never miss. It's the first of the kind of the world. It started with Royal Caribbean on sea. And on land, we have uh, our on the road version, which is a, a containerized version of the robotic bar. And we move it around for events and fairs. And we're also working on new, a very new product. So that will be announced very soon. We really would like to spread this, this technology not only be, not because it replaces uh, uh, the bartender job, but because really it allows people to become bartenders themselves. So we really want to make it social. So imagine if you go to the bar that, and you've been in a, in a robotic bar in Miami, in a maker shaker in Miami, and then you walk to New York, and then you walk on the ship, and you have your history and your preferred drink that you have customized that they are carried around with you into the application across the world. So this is what we're trying, to, what we are aiming to achieve right now. Now this is really interesting because when you have mobile payments around the world, right, the banks make a certain commission every time a transaction takes place, which is why Ericsson and the Ministry of Finance and Economic Planning in Rwanda recently signed quite an interesting agreement for a launch of a national interoperability switch. And what this solution basically means that all financial and payment services providers in the country basically are going to be able to connect to one platform for seamless real-time payment transactions which is quite a huge leap for that specific territory because it really eliminates quite a few of the charges. Now we chatted to Peter Human, the Vice President and Head of M Commerce for Ericsson in Rwanda recently, talking to us about the solution that's really going to democratize payments in many respects. The Rwanda interoperability switch, which is based on the Ericsson M Commerce interconnect switch, is a platform that now interconnects nationwide in Rwanda all parties that are into financial services. So financial service providers, financial systems are now going to all be connected to the Rwanda interoperability switch. One of the main reasons that we find uh, very positive for Rwanda in implementing this uh, switch is that today many service providers in the financial sector are working a little bit in silos, meaning it's quite cumbersome for consumers and businesses to transfer money from one provider to the other. Through this Rwanda interoperability switch where everyone will be connected, we can now seamlessly let money flow between all the parties irrespectively of uh, where you belong and what kind of service you are using. So we think it's going to be very positive and it's going to be an interoperable solution, not only for the telecommunication or the financial sector, but for all of them involved in this. So from Ericsson, we have been responsible for both designing the Rwanda interoperability switch, as well as that we are going to operate and manage this switch for the Rwanda market. 
So that is the main role of Ericsson in providing a seamless 24-7 real-time driven switch for the Rwanda financial sector. In Rwanda, this can have a very accelerating impact on the, both the financial inclusion and the social inclusion. Since uh, we have a fairly high uh, usage of so-called mobile money uh, providers, if we now make sure that we have a full interoperability in the country, we, we fundamentally believe that that will accelerate uh, the financial inclusion in the country and therefore also the social inclu inclusion. We have uh, been involved in collaborating now over a year with the Rwanda government on uh, different uh, ICT projects of which one of them has been regarding this interoperability switch. Uh, I do believe that Rwanda seems to, with the Smart Rwanda project and then belonging to the Smart Africa project, is uh, very eager and, and progressive in, in finding ICT related solutions that uh, the population in Rwanda can benefit from. And we are very happy as Ericsson and being part of this uh, collaboration. We are convinced that we will see activities uh, related to this in also other African nations. Uh, I would say that through the Smart Africa project that uh, is going on here, uh, we see that many nations are following what's going on in different countries and now following uh, this project in Rwanda. And I know from our Ericsson perspective that uh, we have other nations who are very interested in doing something similar. So uh, we feel confident that we will see similar activities and we would be very happy if we could support also other nations and perhaps also connect the nations with these kind of smart solutions. Uh, there are two things that really excite me about this uh, Rwanda interoperability switch. Uh, and the first one is for the people and the country of Rwanda. Uh, we do believe now that we are potentially here in collaboration with the Rwanda government creating history because we do believe that Rwanda now has enabled itself to actually become one of the first digital economies in the world, meaning uh, one of the first cashless societies they are now in position to actually enable that. And uh, the day that will happen, uh, if we could be part, and as we are part of this development now, it, that it really excites us. Uh, the second thing would be that for Ericsson perspective, this is the first truly interoperable switch that we are providing to a country like this. And uh, b having that as our first uh, is also a milestone for us, which we are very proud of, and we hope that we could be part of scaling this in also in other parts of the world. Well, an interesting company for me, and I've been following this company very, very closely, is a company called Xiaomi. Um, and they're a Chinese company, and they've literally taken the world by storm because these guys weren't around 10 years ago. They've really made a name for themselves in particular on the last three, in the last three years and why they've made the name for themselves. And I got a chance to speak to one of their senior people in their organization at Mobile World Congress recently. And the one thing he said to me, he says, look, we don't compromise on quality. We give our customers the best quality that they can get for what they're paying. And the interesting thing about this company as well is that they make smartphones and they've also instantly, interestingly enough announced that they're uh, going to be launching a drone as well smart devices, fitness devices, but their primary market is smartphones. And this is their flagship device that launched just recently. It's called the Xiaomi Mi 5, and it's a fantastic device. And I'll tell you why it's a fantastic device. Because of the quality of the device, and when you look at how this phone is cut, uh, and you look at the quality of the device, and you look at how it just fits into your hand, and you look at the metal around it, and the small things, like the, the edging, there's, it, it's like really smooth, well designed, well made, and the price is astonishing. When you look at what you're paying for this device, it's a, a device that's going to cost you 7,999 Rand. And when you compare this to some of the other brands out there that you're paying in the region of 14, 15,000, those high end premium devices out there, and you say, hey, I'm paying that and I'm comparing this, which has got basically the same features. 16 megapixel camera on this device for 7999. It's really fantastic value for money. And it's, a, it's an interesting company because they update their software so regularly that they interact with their customers. So any bugs that you find uh, on their software, it's literally fixed within days. And this is the modernization of this company. So this is why it's such an interesting, funky company and a name to watch, Xiaomi, all right, Xiaomi.
Not show me, show me, Mr. Shabchak. Like shower with me. I mean, you've been I, following I'm them as well. I'm very impressed with them. I mean, they, they, they have a different business model, which is instead of trying to make a margin on the hardware on the phone, they make a small margin, but they make it on the services, the apps, everything else. And, I, mm. and one of the things I find impressive about Xiaomi is that um, the geeks who uh, use Android and love it have been using their skin for a long time. They've, they've downloaded the Xiaomi overlay to Android yes. and use it on other devices. Now that's a hell of a compliment. Yeah, but I mean, feel the quality of this device. No, it's, I've it's played a, with it's, it. I'm very impressed with it. Yeah, you know, the curve on the back of the screen is is a better place to put it because it just fits into your hand better. The, the quality of the finishing, the quality of the, of the, of the phone itself, the screen is clear and bright, it's very responsive to the touchscreen, high megapixel camera that works very effectively. In general, just a great device and, you know, killer app at a great price. I, 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 I would go as far as to say that this phone, for the price and the value that you're getting, is surely a contender for phone of the year. I mean, that's how good this device is for the price. And I'm talking about when you factor in the price and everything else around it. But the interesting thing I was talking about earlier, that these guys are now making wearable devices and they're also announced and a, drone. a drone. Yeah, I, I mean, it's play very with interesting. You yeah. know, I'm very used to playing with the drone. Yeah, I'm very used to listening to a drone <laughs> on my left. And that's it for tonight's show, folks. Keep on tweeting and tweet us. Uh, the show's Twitter account is at TechBusters SA, and he's at Shapshack. I'm at Aki Anastasiu. We'd love to hear your views and tell us how you're using technology. And thank you for sharing all those amazing tweets about the, the wow stuff that you've seen across the continent. And we love hearing about those success stories and how technology is making a difference to people's lives. So thank you for joining us and we look forward to speaking to you again next week. 